Hi guys, uh, my name is Ashish and uh, I'm here for the second session. So this is going to be the topic is mixing FOH and uh, let me answer all your questions. I think I will try and answer them <laughs> to my best ability as possible. And uh, if I am wrong somewhere, do let me know because even I am learning also as you guys are learning. So it'll be good. Let's go for it. So our first question is from Harsh Maheshwari, who asks, how do you deal with microphone bleed from the crowd and individual microphones on drums and guitar caps as drum shields and ISO booths are not always available? And how do you go about gating process and other stuff? So Harsh, what we normally do is, uh, for us, most of the bleed comes from singers. And we end up using supercardoid uh, microphones on singers. As you know, the supercardoid pattern is uh, very tight and it allows for less bleed of outside elements to come in uh, and it captures more of the proximity, uh, the, the signal which is the closest to it. So if the vocal is closest to it, that is what it will capture better and it will reject uh, or at least to some extent it will reject. Uh, uh, the other elements are surrounding it. So that is how you can uh, reduce the microphone microphone bleed. The other thing to do is maybe you can create between the stage and the crowd, maybe you can create a little bit of a distance, say around uh, uh, approximately six to 10 feet. So even if the crowd is shouting, that doesn't uh, bleed into uh, the singer's microphones or the other microphones as possible. Now, as far as drums and guitar cabs go, drums and guitar cabs are really, really loud. So you really don't need to shield them uh, from other instruments, uh, but the other instruments do need to be shielded from them. So what we do is, uh, this, this is from my personal uh, thing is, uh, that nowadays we, since everybody is on in-ears and IEMs and everything, we mic up the guitar cabs, but we put the guitar cabs in such a position on the stage that they're angled away and that they are not disturbing anyone. Drum shields uh, for drum kits are... Uh, I have invariably found that uh, maybe during ballroom gigs as such, we may require a drum shield. But if it's an open stage and an outdoor show, or even if it is, uh, say, like a convention center, which is pretty big, we don't really uh, require a drum shield because the stage is big enough uh, for the drum kit to not uh, come in the way of other things. So that is what uh, we use. And uh, as far as gating process goes, I actually don't use gates. Very rarely, very rarely. I'm not, I will not say uh, like I do not use gates. No, sometimes yes. But mostly I use expanders and how expanders work is if a signal is low enough below a threshold, then it will lower it further, but it will not cut it off like a gate. So there will always be a moderate amount of signal available for you. And the moment, so it's like a half gate, you know, so there is a certain amount of uh, signal available. I'm putting it very simply, actually. There is a certain amount of signal available and the moment uh, that signal becomes or crosses the threshold becomes louder, then the whole thing comes up nicely. So in this way, I am not really gating it. So when uh, say the drummer is uh, mostly we end up using them on drums is doing like a very slow or he's, you know, just creating like a, like maybe he use, he's using brushes or something. So uh, what happens is that all those elements also uh, are available for us and they can be heard. Uh, as opposed to a gate which may sort of just you know cut off the thing or even uh, say for the kick drum if he's like just softly you know pedaling the kick drum uh, that will also come through and not just get cut off because of the noise gate on to the next question Shahbaz Ali how to get the perfect dynamic river perfect time according to tempo okay and do we need to use multiple reverb blends? Yes, uh, Shavas. Uh, now for live, uh, this can be a little difficult. You can you can uh, set the early reflections and uh, the sustain of a reverb to uh, you know in time with the tempo of the song, for sure. But for that, you need to know the tempo of the song beforehand, and for that, you need to be able to define the quarter note of that thing. 
I'll give you a very handy tip. Uh, if you divide 60,000 by the tempo, then you will get the quarter note or you can download a tempo app for that. So if you know the song, then you can maybe create a snapshot in which the reverbs, uh, the decay or the early reflection of the reverb is set to, uh, of course, the early reflection will not be a quarter note. It'll be much less than that, maybe a 1 16th uh, note as such. So you can keep doing 60,000 divided by tempo divided by 2 divided by 2. So you will get to that. Or you can just download a tempo app if you want. Do we need to use multiple reverb blends? Yes, definitely. Uh, I don't think you'll use the same reverb which you use on a singer on maybe the snare or on uh, the percussions. You will not do that, of course. So you will use a different kind of reverb. Maybe you'll use a shorter reverb. Maybe you will not, not have the pre-delay, uh, say for a snare uh, or uh, for percussions like congas and all. You will not have the pre-delay, uh, you know, uh, extended. You will have it like extremely short or maybe no pre-delay delay at all. So you don't get that flutter in the sound. Uh, but on a singer, that sounds good. If there is a little bit of a pre-delay, uh, it sounds good because the reverb comes slightly behind the voice and that sort of enhances the singing. So yes, definitely you should use multiple reverb blends to achieve uh, things in your mix for sure. Uh, the Deep Beats Band, actually I want to join Sound Engineering. Can you suggest any institution for that? Uh, there are lots of institutions. Uh, there is Sound Ideas. Then now there is a new one called TAG. There is True School of Music. Uh, they all teach Sound Engineering and they're really good schools. You can uh, access them on Facebook. Uh, you can just search for them on Facebook and you'll find them there and you can contact them through Facebook for sure. And uh, if you want to do live sound, then uh, there is Audio Academy in Bangalore. Uh, they are also there on Facebook. You can approach them. They are excellent for recording, uh, for uh, uh, live sound engineering courses and stuff like that. Dashan Desai, can you please ask Ashi sir that I am an aspiring sound engineer and particularly interested in live sound. I'm planning to learn professionally in a music school and wanted to know if there are any good career opportunities in the field. Definitely, Darshan, right now, despite this sort of pause that we are in uh, because of the coronavirus, the live sound market has just been growing. There are lots of bands are coming in. There are lots of new rental companies which have, uh, you know, uh, come up so for sure this is an evolving field and definitely there is work available for you once you finish off your uh, your music school education i would suggest that you join a rental company and learn the ropes in a rental company and that's how it'll give you a nice base you know when for your future things and uh, remember there are lots of things that are now the field is open so don't just look at mixing as a career there is also monitor engineering is uh, there there is a systems engineer so you know you set up your pas and everything via software and everything in systems and make sure they are aligned correctly so that is a big opportunity now uh, rf uh, is now playing a big part because we use so many of these wireless iems and wireless microphones so rf is also opening up as a as a big field now in live sound so Definitely look at all the other uh, opportunities that are available in life. So, the Music Pro can't widen enough my track, especially the bass. Please help. Um, I'm not don't sort of understand this, but uh, let me try and help you in two ways. Uh, if you're actually uh, from a mix perspective, uh, the things which are at the bottom are the bass guitar and the bass drum, the kick drum. So what you can do is uh, for the bass guitar you can uh, try and find the lowest fundamental frequency of a bass guitar so what you can do is you can sweep uh, your eq and till where you can hear the low end and then where you can't hear the low end that's the supposedly the lowest fundamental frequency of uh, the bass guitar now the thing is to not enhance that so say if it's 40 hertz for example below 40 hertz there is not there is no not much energy in the bass guitar so what you can do is say around 25 to 30 hertz you can uh, slowly roll off so that you get a clean uh, bottom end and don't boost 40 hertz what you do is you boost the next harmonic 
So if you say do into two, which is 40 into two, which is 80 hertz, boost a little bit of 80 hertz, and that will sort of uh, you know bring out, uh, and that will create some more harmonics and overtones below and above, and it will sort of help in enhancing your bass guitar. Try it. I can't really you know, I don't, <laughs> but try it for sure. Uh, you can apply the same thing to the bass drum also. There's another trick to the bass drum. What you can do is, uh, if you want uh, your uh, uh, bass drum to come out cleanly, what you can do is you can side chain it to the bass guitar, and every time the bass and the bass drum kicks in, the bass guitar will sort of you know go down, get a little compressed, and then come back in out, and that's how you can sort of accentuate your bass drum. I hope that helps. Uh, you can give it a try. You can look for some more YouTube videos on. YouTube and to see how you can help. Uh, Nikhil Nitin, what is the meaning of placement in a song? Bro, uh, I, you need to be a little more specific. I'm really sorry. I am not understanding this. Uh, Mohamed Farid, sir, I'm an aspirant of Life Sound Engineer. Please guide us. Uh, Farid, if, you're, if you've been watching this far, I have already spoken about a few institutes and academies which are available a little earlier and you can uh, definitely approach them and join them and learn from them. Nilesh Gupta, how can we manage both separately front of house and monitor console with band? Uh, Nilesh, you can. I mean, uh, that is what we all started off with. I am still mixing uh, two bands like that, which is uh, KK and Ayushman. So definitely there is, I don't see any hassle at all. As long as there are enough inputs and auxes on a particular console, I mean, that's a normal way of mixing. I mean, uh, only big, big bands have uh, separate monitor consoles and separate uh, FOH. Not not every band can afford to do that. Not every, and sometimes when the bands, some bands can afford to do it, like I mix for KK and he can, they can afford to do it, but it's only four guys. So really we don't feel the need to have a monitor engineer available uh, for that. So yes, you can definitely. Top to bottom, importance of reverb and delay in any song. Of course, it is very, very important for to have reverb and delay in any song. Uh, that sort of adds the sparkle to the song. It enhances uh, the song for sure. So yes, definitely very important. Harsh Verma, it will be very informative if he can share some session for live mixing. Uh, Harsh, we can definitely look at this uh, in some future episodes unfortunately i don't have access uh, you know since because of the coronavirus we all uh, you know shut down and uh, closed off so i don't have access to a console right now but uh, when this happens we'll definitely do one uh, for sure i will do this sanawar ali sir hame kaise pata chale ga ki kaun se frequency kisi dusre instruments ke saath clash nahi kar rahe hain sanawar ji ye aapko thoda ear training training isme karna padega aap tarah tarah ke gaane sunen aur usme jaise agar aap gaana sun rahe hain to usme aap bass guitar ko follow karne ki koshish kare ya drums ko follow karne ya guitar ko follow karne ki koshish kare taki aapke kaan zara zyada एक्सपीरियंस गेन कर पाए इस बात इस चीज़ों में आप सोलो इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स भी सुन के उनका जो टोनैलिटी होता है उनका जो टिम्बर होता है आप उसको भी यू नो ग्रैस्प करने की कोशिश करें जब आप ये सब थोड़ा एक्सपीरियंस के साथ आपको ये सब नेचुरली आने लगेगा देन डेफिनेटली आप ऐसा इक्वलाइजेशन करना शुरू करेंगे कि ये इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स ज़्यादा क्लैश नहीं करें एक दूसरे के साथ और साइड चेनिंग का एक्चुअली साइड चेनिंग में हम लोग जो नॉर्मली जो एकदम ही क्लिशेड और बेसिक साइड चेनिंग है कि हम लोगों ने बेस गिटार को बेस ड्रम के साथ साइड चेन कर दिया तो जब भी बेस ड्रम बचता है वो बेस गिटार को नीचे खींचता है बट ये ज़रूरी नहीं है आप इसको काफ़ी अदर दूसरी चीज़ों में भी यूज़ कर सकते हैं जैसे अगर आप की बज रहे हैं अगर स्ट्रिंग्स बज रही हैं और ये और कुछ कॉर्ड्स बज रहे हैं और उनको भी थोड़ा ऊपर रखना है लेकिन वोकल्स भी आपको ज़रा रखने हैं तो एवरी टाइम वोकल्स जब आएंगे तो आप साइड चेन ऐसा कर सकते हैं कि जैसे जब वो गा रहा हो उस टाइम पे कॉर्ड्स अपने आप साइड चेन में दब जाएं थोड़े से ज़्यादा नहीं 
थोड़े से और जैसे ही वो गाना बंद करे अपने आप कॉर्ड्स या स्ट्रिंग्स या पैड्स जो भी हैं वो अपने आप अपने लेवल पे आ जाएं तो आप ये भी एक और तरीका है जिससे आप साइड चेनिंग यूज कर सकते हैं वो रहा वही ओके इंडियन इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स को आइडियल तरीके से पैरामीट्रिक ई कैसे करें लाइव साउंड में डिजिटल मिक्सिंग कॉन्सोल सर इसका मैं अभी सनावर जी को इसी के बारे में जवाब दे रहा था तो आप सेम अगर आप वो पढ़ें या सुने तो आपको डेफिनेटली इससे फायदा होगा राहुल तिवारी हेलो आशीष सर माय क्वेश्चन इज इफ अ पर्सन इज अ साउंड इंजीनियर हुज फोकस इज इन फिल्म मिक्स फोली एंड लाइव लोकेशन सो कैन ही गो इन टू लाइव एफ ओ एच फील्ड विद डिजाइनिंग नॉलेज राहुल डेफिनेटली आई सी दीज आर ऑल ब्रांचेस ऑफ साउंड ओनली सो इफ यू हैव योर बेसिक्स डाउन यू नो वॉट एन इक्वलाइजेशन यू नो यू नो वॉट्स एन ई क्यू वॉट्स अ कंप्रेसर वॉट्स यू यू हैव योर एप्टीट्यूड इन प्लेस यू योर ईयर्स आर लिल बिट ट्रेन डेफिनेटली देन यू जस्ट नीड टू लर्न हाउ अ कॉन्सोल वर्क और हाउ यू नो इट्स जस्ट जस्ट अ डिफरेंट एनवायरमेंट बट द बेसिक एलिमेंट्स आर ऑल द सेम सो येस फॉर श्योर यू कैन Uh, you can jump into live sound if you want for sure akash kashyap can you differentiate between foh and general studio mixing uh basically abhi kya ho gaya hai akash uh, ki uh, live or studio kafi uh, close aa gaye hain abhi i would say ki uh, itna itna abhi zyada difference nahi hai the only difference which i find and i do is uh, like maybe i would eq a little differently uh, when i'm mixing for live i would not eq so much i would eq much less than i would be doing for uh, the uh, live uh, this thing then the studio studio i would eq much more studio i would compress much more but i use less compression when i'm mixing for live so these are a few differences that i have otherwise uh, studio mixing and uh, live sound mixing have now become extremely close now with the advent of plugins the advent of these digital consoles uh, you know really fancy consoles working at 96 kilohertz and everything so these things have become now extremely close and you know very uh, tight bound with each other and for online courses i would suggest that you can uh, you can go to the waves website there are the guys who make the waves plugins and uh, they have a lot they have a lot of uh, you know webinars and uh, videos available for you to uh, learn for mixing and mastering i think even universal audio has uh, lots of these uh, available so you can definitely uh, go to these websites and see all the videos youtube of course is another big big uh, you know ocean of learning available for you so yes for sure you can do that and subendu ji you have posted a lot of questions so i am going to take all of them together if you don't mind uh have any video where we can see your live foh work uh, you can search for kk shankar asan loy ayushman on uh, youtube and uh, of course please they will be horrible because they have all been recorded off a phone or something like that by uh, fans and audiences so but yes you can definitely hear how do you pan the instruments i use a very conventional format of panning i don't go for any uh, uh, unique uh, or avant garde type of panning so uh if it's drums then i like pan the toms a little bit the overheads a little bit uh, basically physical placement of how i see the kit is how i'll pan it uh some instruments are uh, naturally panned like keyboards and all come to you in stereo so they are naturally panned now uh, some of the guitarists now have started doing uh, stereo so they of course also all got stereo panned uh sometimes some instruments are there like flute is there and uh, saxophone and all is there so i but i do not to do any drastic panning i will not pan something full left or full right uh because when you are mixing for live you have the audience all around you and you know just everywhere so if you pan something full left or full right then the audience on the opposite side will not be able to hear that instrument uh you know properly so i don't do that i pan maybe half way and not more than that any indian artist who you really love to work with 
I working with some of the greatest best artists possible Mr Shankar Mahadevan uh, KK so I mean they I really love working with them and it's it's it's, it's an honor and you know privilege for me to be able to mix for these artists for sure how do you handle if there is a huge ensemble the regular way you start off in the regular way and then you just carry on and keep sound checking and in the end you end up mixing so there is no i don't have any special methods for that who is your idol whom do you follow in india and abroad i don't have an idol per se but i will definitely give credit to two people who were extremely helpful uh to me when i was uh, when i had just joined live sound because i actually come from a studio uh, background i did a lot of work in studio before uh coming out and mixing live so one is dwayne das uh he taught me how to mix uh he taught me about drums and guitars and keyboards and how to keep them mixed together he taught taught me about gain structure so i give him a lot of credit uh, you know for where i am today for sure and the other person is bruce rodricks and bruce taught me how to handle the band how to handle the events guys and how to handle the audience because uh, at one time they were uh, most of my shows were with them uh, they uh, used to work with uh, with a very big uh, vendor uh Roger Drago I can't remember the their the actual name of the company but Roger Drago everybody knows and uh, they used to handle all the big events all the big events they used to handle all the festivals uh you know I, the initial IPL in Bangalore when it happened uh you know all the all the all the shows which used to come from abroad so they they were extremely experienced and uh, both these boys they taught me a hell of a lot for sure and definitely I had a good grounding education from these two on all the aspects of live sound uh you know not just uh, mixing but also how to handle uh, things for sure uh abroad i actually yeah okay abroad i follow uh, mr robert scoville i feel that his uh, style of mixing and his uh, approach uh, to the entire audio industry is extremely sort of compatible to how i think so i uh, definitely follow mr robert scoville from abroad do you decide the mic placements on the instruments uh, yes i do it's my job i mean <laughs> that's why i have been hired <laughs> partly to uh, make sure that the mics are correctly placed on the instruments so yes can auto tune be used live yes it can be used live if you are uh, very uh, savvy with it you can definitely use it you can use both auto tune and waves tune live waves tune now is very easy for you to use because uh, Uh, they have now made uh, packages available for live sound, so you can just connect them to various consoles and uh, use uh, Waves. And Waves has something called Waves Tune, and you can definitely use it. Uh, types of mixers, uh, I, uh, you will have to elaborate on this question. So, when do I don't? I mean, there's digital and there's analog. So, <laughs> really, uh, do you prefer headphone or open mix to monitor? I definitely prefer mixing to the PA. there is no two ways about it i mean 100% i will mix uh, if i if it is uh, available for me i will definitely mix uh, to an open pa sometimes you have to mix to headphones uh, sometimes what happens is uh, you are caught in a situation uh, like i'll give you an example we uh, had a show in a mall in one of the delhi malls and we were not allowed to make uh, any noise so i could not have the pa on so i did the entire sound check and uh, uh, everything on headphones and then only in the evening when the show was uh, you know about to happen is when they allowed us to open up the pa so yes uh, i do uh, i am not averse to mixing on headphones but definitely mixing on the pa is uh, you know much preferred are analog gears better than digital this is very subjective so uh, totally depends uh nowadays the emulation also has become so much better on a personal choice for me i don't really like using analog gear because uh there are some pieces of gear which i really like uh, i like a lot of the manly stuff and uh, ssl stuff but 
it's very cumbersome to carry it very cumbersome to keep attaching it you know how the shows are we go in on the same day you know we barely get some time to sound check uh, and then immediately the show happens and then uh, next morning we are out of there so it's very cumbersome and tedious to carry analog equipment and connect it and everything for us so i i and and nowadays with the advent of plugins and everything it's all available for you now in the digital format the same uh you know same things like ssl is all available to you as plugins uh you know fairchild and everything is all available for you as plugins so i personally this is my personal choice i i mean there are lots of other engineers who will uh you know not agree with me but this is my personal choice that i don't really like to use analog gear for uh mixing a live sound in the studio we do have <laughs> some analog gear for sure mix engineers tell that two instruments should not clash at a same frequency register and then how lots of instruments uh so when you so what you have to understand this in this is that even if you take two similar instruments like say extremely similar similar instruments like a recorder and a flute still the fundamentals of these two instruments differ why because one is made out of metal one is made out of bamboo the overtones the timber and the partials also differ so that is what defines the sound of that particular instrument therefore like everything is a sine wave yes but what defines the sound of the instrument is the are the overtones the timber of the instrument and the partials which partials are just uh, half harmonics or uh, which are not which are not odd even it's like in the middle so that's what sort of defines the instrument so uh even if they have a similar frequency range they will not they will not sound the same and they can come across as two different instruments just because of this factor describe pink noise testing uh what is this in regard to so when maybe you can elaborate on this in a future episode uh, if you're talking from live sound why we play pink noise uh, on the pa i can yes explain that to you so basically pink noise is a 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz equal energy per per octave uh, uh, signal uh, that's around 10 octaves but it also falls up by 3 db in the upper octaves and the reason why we play pink noise on the pa is to find any bumps or dips in the pa because if you understand uh, when the pa is set up it can be any kind of a situation it could be an open ground could be a ballroom could be a con- convention center auditorium could be any kind of a you know arena could be any kind of a situation so all situations have their own uh, issues and their own uh, you know acoustic uh, problems that may crop up so after you set up everything if you play pink noise then maybe you can find out where the peaks and the dips are in the system and then maybe you can you know uh through a graphic eq or through a parametric nowadays we prefer to use a parametric eq uh you can bring those uh you know peaks down don't bring the dips up because those uh will definitely create a very artificial uh, sound but yes you can bring the peaks down and sort of flatten the system don't flatten it too much uh because nobody likes a full flat system our ears also are not used to a full flat system so you can bring the dip uh, the peaks down a little bit and that's why that's what pink noise is used for sometimes artist on the stage moves his volume knob in sorry inside a song to get clear um if he moves his knob really you can't do anything on the front of house if you catch it in time then maybe you can uh, immediately drop the gain a little bit but then again what will happen is that if you're doing monitors from front of house that will again hamper uh, you know his the person stage monitoring i this is something which you need to talk to the musician gain their trust have an open communication with the artist with the musician and ensure that everything is sort of in place and locked before the show and that the artist musician does not you know touch his uh, guitar amp ka volume knob or his keyboard volume knob you know he should not do that for sure uh, but that's something that you build up with the artist uh, through trust and communication for sure prevention and instant cures for microphone howling um lots of videos are available for you on youtube so when do for uh, notching out frequencies on the monitors and try and use super cardioid microphones as far as possible uh, they have a, sm- a slightly smaller pattern uh, cardioid pattern so definitely they can help you 
with that. If I'm an artist, how can I share my ideas with a... Is that a strange? <laughs> Did you mean strange or is that a stage? Uh, FOH engineer easily. Uh, what you can see, I do not encourage uh, having much interaction during a show unless something has drastically gone wrong. So most of your, most of the musicians requirements, all of the musicians requirements should be met during sound check. So definitely what you can do, do during sound check is you can have a couple of open mics on stage so musicians can walk up to that mic and talk to you over them. You can use the same open mic technique uh, even during the show. You can have a wedge next to you. Uh, you can dedicate an aux to it and any musician can walk up to that mic and talk to you and only you will hear it on the wedge. So that's another way of interaction, interacting with the, uh, the musician. You can do some agreed upon hand signals uh, during the show. So, you know, the musician or the artist is not flailing around helplessly, you know, signaling to you. You know, you can just like do this for hats or, uh, you know, just some uh, things for guitar or something. You can decide on those hand signals and it can be done very, because uh, let me tell you very frankly, it doesn't really look very nice and doesn't look very professional with artists, you know, uh, uh, sort of talking on the mic to the engineer and asking for things. I mean. Uh, really, I mean, we are doing an event, it has to be professional and these things should all be sorted out during sound check. Still one of my artists doesn't do that and he will still interact with me <laughs> during a live show, so uh, you can't really help that. What is the income of an FOH engineer? That is very subjective, uh, Subhendu. Uh, let me be very frank about it. I, from what I know, uh, prices can range from as low as five, ten thousand, right up to a lakh of rupees, uh, for sure. It depends totally on your experience, your uh, you know uh, success in the line. That's what it, it depends on. If there is no memory program in a mixer, how will you quickly manage different genres coming up by? Uh, different genres maybe you mean uh, I'm not too sure what you mean by that but uh, suppose you're in a festival scenario and uh, you have a lot of bands and you really can't save each band's sound check or mix uh, you know on a on a on a memory program as you say or a pen drive uh, so what you can do is you can have some common channels for sure so you can have common channels for drums so make sure that every drummer of every band uh, plays and that's the drum kit and that's what he plays on. You can uh, define common channels for guitars, for bass, for, you know, keyboards. And then if they have, uh, you know, some unique instruments, like uh, one person may come in with a sarangi and another person may come in with a flute. So those uh, channels can be, uh, you know, kept uh, separate on uh, this thing. There also, again, if you feel like, uh, you know, like dhol dholak and all, you, if you feel like, no, okay, these are my dhol lines or these are my tabla lines and uh, when the next guy comes he can play on the same tabla line so if you can have some common uh, channel inputs together you can definitely uh, set up mixes and you know do sound checks much faster what is the difference between a band and an award show uh, with a band and a, um, bro you'll have to elaborate on this I'm not really sure I mean an award show is an award show and a band is like a musical performance if you're asking me about a band during an award show, let me be very frank about this and tell you that uh, most of the times the band is not live. There will definitely be a track playing like a minus one. Maybe the singer is live. Sometimes the singer is also not live. So, and this happens, I will tell you why this happens. This happens not because that the band uh, doesn't, the band actually does want to perform and that's why they formed the band, to perform and play for the audience. But these award shows are so tight on time and so tight on placement and you know, uh, the stages move around and there's not enough, uh, you know, it's very tight, all these things are very tight, you know. So then suddenly in the middle of it all, to bring a band, place their instruments and, you know, and put them up and everything and mic them and because, you know, for award shows, everything gets taken off. 
and uh, and things are brought in taken off brought in taken off so it's it's and it's not even like a festival where they give you enough time uh, you know like a 15 20 minute break while or another stage is playing while this one is being set up so it's not like that during an award show and everything is you know has to go perfectly so that is one of the reasons why they like to go with either a minus one and the band mimes to it or a plus one and the band mimes to it and the singer mimes to it too do you have any effect or eq on the master track yes i do i have an EQ on my master track. It's a parametric. I normally end up using either a Waves uh, Q10 or a Sonox uh, the five band. I think they have. And uh, this is not for me to uh, EQ the system or uh, you know or sort of uh, align the system. This is only for me to create an EQ curve in how I personally would like to hear the PA. So that is what I use uh, the EQ for. Describe gain staging in FOH. This is a vast, vast subject, Vindu, and I'm sure you'll find lots of videos online for this. Uh, very difficult to explain right now here. And also it's a very general question. If you ask me specifically to some instruments, then yes, I can, maybe I can take a stab at it. How do you add what kind of effects to different kind of, uh, See some some uh, some instruments. It's extremely natural uh, to add an effect. Uh, like to a singer, you will definitely add some reverb and delay. To a flute, you will certainly add a reverb and delay. Maybe to a flute, you may add like a hall reverb. You know, a longer reverb sometimes because that really works really well uh, with a flute. You could do the same thing with a saxophone. Uh, you can use short reverbs, plate reverbs with the drums, the percussions. Uh, charties, not so much on the buyer because low end uh, really reverbs and all have no effect on low end. So on the charty and definitely you can have a little bit of reverb. So uh, some of them are uh, immediately uh, sort of uh, visible to you or you understand, ki, okay, this is the kind of reverb I need to use. Sometimes on some certain instruments, you may try like a different reverb and it may work very well. So you uh, yes, of course, you can definitely try uh, different reverbs on the instruments for sure. How does your mix differ according to the size of auditorium, open area and different locations? Actually, my mix doesn't differ at all. 95% of my mix will remain the same. I would much rather align the PA to the auditorium, the open area, ground or, you know, uh, to uh, ballrooms or convention centers, I would much rather align the PA rather than change my mix. Uh, and why is this? Is because uh, I am also mixing monitors from front of house for some artists. So if I end up changing my mix, then uh, or if I start changing my gains uh, too drastically, then that will affect the monitors also. So uh, definitely, I try and keep my mix as same as possible gains as same as possible and I would much rather redo the PA for that. Speak about the scopes of FOH engineers. It's a very general question, Juvenu, you will need to elaborate on this and be a little more specific. Are you involved in practice sessions? Uh, do you participate in the arrangement of any songs? Uh, I am involved uh, in the sense, yes, when the band, uh, the bands rehearse then definitely uh, I will go in and I will hear the rehearsal. Uh, sometimes if there are some changes uh, made to a song or you know they have done a different arrangement, uh, they definitely ask for my opinion. And of course they are totally welcome to not accept my opinion because uh, they, they being musicians know better than me. Uh, but yes, I do, I do for sure. How do you level the instruments? I really don't know what uh, you'll have to elaborate on this. Do artists misbehave if they don't get uh, required sound? Uh, why shouldn't they get required sound? Uh, you know, they should get the required sound. If they don't get their required sound, so to speak, then how are they going to play? How are they going to, you know, be able to uh, perform for the art for the audience? So, I think you should go all out to make sure that your musician, your artist, your singer is extremely comfortable and is able to perform at 100%. That is your job. I mean, that exactly is your job. Uh, 
rather than just mixing outside the band. I mean, what will you mix if the band doesn't get to perform well because they're not able to hear each other correctly, then that will affect their playing also, which will affect your mix also. So for sure, you should try and be a hundred percent there for your band. And the way to deal with the artists is you have to build up trust and you have to communicate with the artists. Uh, you know, even during uh, we, we were doing this monitor, you know, workshop and I pointed this out at that time also that when you are there, you should be looking up at the band. You should have a smiling demeanor. I don't have a smiling demeanor, unfortunately, but my bands know me well and they, uh, when other people think I'm frowning and angry, they actually know that no, it's not. It's just my face and like that. So what i do or what i suggest everyone to do is to not just keep looking down into the mixer like you're totally lost but look up you know and uh, look at the band uh, immediately try and catch if there are any reactions actions from the band if somebody is signaling to you uh, you know be on the ball uh, immediately uh, you know try and uh, uh, you know grab the mic and uh, ask that guy yeah yeah tell me what happened uh, what do you need what what is there so you have to be open and communicative if in case you have any issues, you're having some issues with the console, be communicative, inform the band that I am having some problems with the mixer. Can you give me five minutes? Can you give me 10 minutes? If it's a major problem, you can ask them, uh, you know, to uh, leave the stage, rest in the green room and that you will go and you will call them uh, when the problems have been resolved. Don't leave anybody hanging or not knowing because that sort of builds up, you know, that little, uh, um, I will not, I mean, frustration maybe. So be very communicative uh, with the band. Talk to them, uh, ask them beforehand uh, what would they require in their monitoring setup. When the show is over, don't just disappear. Go meet the band again. Ask them how it was. Would they would they like to do? Would they like you to do anything differently, uh, or any you know improvements can be made. So definitely, you know, so have an open communication with the band, try and build uh, the trust between you and them, uh, you know, so that tomorrow when you say something, they will listen to you and accept it also. So that sort of, uh, I'm finished now with the first part and uh, I'm now going to do a little bit of an offline thing. So uh, continue watching and uh, I'll be back in a sec.